I, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a LARPer. I'm not, I don't have that much experience with the LARP community. Although my first LARP was at a um, summer camp in 2004 at a socialist youth summer camp. So I have like, I've done three LARPs in my life. Four, three, four, yeah. I'm a designer and, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. A sort of sub practice uh, that designers and artists are engaging in that I feel has a lot of similarities with LARP, um, which is called, or has many names, but one of them are called is speculative design. And um, I've called this talk, Making Possible Futures Tangible. And I'm going to start with a quote from a um, book called Speculative Everything, written by Anthony Dunn and Fiona, Fiona Raby, um, which is sort of uh, very like fundamental within like the f speculative design practice. Dreams are powerful. They are repositories of our desire. They animate an entertainment industry and drive consumptions. They can blind people to reality and provide cover for political horror. But they can also inspire us to imagine that things could be radically different than they are today and then believe we can progress towards an, that imaginary world. It is hard to say what today's dreams are. It seems they have been downgraded to hopes. Hopes that we will not allow ourselves to become extinct. Hope that we can feed the starving. Hope that there will be room for us on this tiny planet. There are no more visions. We don't know how to fix the planet and ensure our, our survival. We're just hopeful. As Frederick Jameson famously remarked, it is now easier for us to imagine the end of the world than an alternative to capitalism. Yet alternatives are exactly what we need. We need to dream new dreams for the 21st century, as those of the 20th century rapidly fade. But what role can design play? So as I said, I'm a designer. I'm studying collaborative industrial design at Aldo University. And uh, it's a very like eclectic master program. It deals with everything from like graphic design and product design, sort of the simple scale, and then to a little bit more advanced of interaction design, user experience, um, upwards towards service design, and then in the end you have systemic design, uh, which deals with the things that Eleanor talked about, and um, for instance, designing policies or the internet. Uh, there's sort of this common perception that design is supposed to be problem solving. So like whether it's a blueprint or a clever UI or a chair, you're, you're solving a visual or a physical problem. But for speculative design or um, what Dunn and Raby call critical design or design fiction, discursive design, there's a lot of names. Um, they want to, they wrote this manifesto because they wanted to instate a practice that instead of being problem solving, designers could be problem finding. They could be, f they could be finding problems. And they could, instead of using design as a process, you're using design as a medium um, in order to uh, make us think instead of make us buy stuff. Or um, provoke instead of innovate. Um, and act as a service for the society instead of a service for uh, shareholders or you know whoever is owning w the design you're trying uh, you're selling. Dunn and Raby calls it critical design that questions the cultural, social, and ethical implications of emerging technologies, a form of design that can help us define the most desirable futures and avoid the least desirable. Um, so they use this future cone um, illustration to sort of say like, okay, uh, the most probable future is the one that, you know, you sort of, you don't think about it. It's like whatever goes forward. Um, but then there is like possibilities that are like plausible. They could happen. They're sort of like a little bit, a little bit more like on the side. And then there's possible futures that are in the periphery. And the idea of speculative design is that if you 
if you um, make these futures tangible, if you show um, that these futures could exist, you can start um, you can start thinking about and discussing like what future is preferable, like what way do we want to go, which which of the which of these alternatives we want do we want? And I mean, the future is not a fixed destination; it's constantly shifting and moving, and it, it has lots of potential. And that's sort of the idea of perspective design that you show this potential of, of different possibilities. So it's about asking, what if, and then design what would happen then. So what if we develop this type of technology, or what if this societal change happens? Uh, if AI develops this way, if we get climate change, what happens in society then, or what kind of, um, what kind of products do we need to survive in a world that is completely underwater, for instance? Um, the aim is to present complex abstract issues as fictional products or services so um, viewers or I don't know people can explore the ethical and social issues within the context of everyday life so sort of yeah well you'll see Does it work? ran out of toilet paper at home. What type would you like to order? Triple layer, extra soft, or single layer recycled paper? Iris, I thought you knew me. Extra soft toilet paper for sure. Ah, the sensitive type. Do you want to add this purchase to your Citizen Score account? Yes, add that please. I want my Citizen Score as high as possible. Wise choice, a more complete buying profile strengthens your Citizen Score. On another note, you still need to book your ticket to London for next week. Oh, thanks for reminding me. Please book my ticket to London. Where would you like to book your ticket? KLM or EasyJet? EasyJet's fine. Okay, booking EasyJet. This flight might have a relatively large number of people from lower income classes. Beware, this could lower your citizen score. Don't forget to set up your profile. Iris, set up my profile. By continuing, you will agree to my terms of service. If you need more information, feel free to ask me about it. To verify your account, I require your email address and credit card information. Would you like to continue? Sure, you know how I trust you. In fact, you don't even have to ask me for permission anymore. Linking information to your personal profile. Sit back and relax. No need to tell me anything. I already know everything about you. By the way, your mother called an hour ago. You might want to return the call. Really? Why didn't you tell me before? Please call Nancy. Let's see if we can reach your mother. No response. Do you want to look up her current whereabouts? Sure. Tell me where she is. All right, let's find out where she is. Looks like she is shopping. Wait, unbelievable. She is still shopping at XP supermarkets. Shopping at XP lowers her citizen score, thereby lowering your score as well. Better convince her to shop elsewhere. Your citizen score dropped below 3,420. You can now only interact with people who have a citizen score above 10,000. Facebook error. Your Facebook engagement score is too low for us to monetize. I can no longer be of service to you. Goodbye. So I say I've structured this presentation um, with lots of examples. So that's basically what we're going to be doing today. We're going to look at lots of examples. Um, here's another one. This is a FOMO breather. Basically, you can breathe into it when, you, when your anxiety gets too high while scrolling Instagram or Facebook, seeing all the cool stuff that you're missing out on, like the people that are not here at the state of the LARP. They might need one of these. <laughs> Or this uh, scans your how symmetric or attractive your face is, so it can give you discounts in shops and restaurants based on your social media accounts. Because obviously, you know, if you're pretty, like you should get a discount. 
this project by Alex Gallet is um, um, provides a solution for those that cherish their privacy. Um, so with a fake nose or ears or fingertips, uh, you can pretend to be somebody else or just kind of trick uh, these facial recognition um, systems so that it doesn't recognize you as a human or it recognizes you as somebody else. You can put a different nose on and then it won't, like, it will think you're somebody else. Um, near future laboratory uh, designed this um, IKEA catalog based on a sort of, like, some sort of near future about Internet of Things. Um, and it's a whole IKEA catalog, so you can download the whole from their website. Uh, one of one of the things here is a, a sort of like um, it's a it's called avkoblat, which means like logged out, and it's like a bed where you can you know uh, be away from all the internet and <laughs> uh, and the reason why they wanted to use IKEA catalog is because it's like it's one of the like very iconic ways of representing a normal, ordinary, everyday life. Um, so it kind of, it shows like routine furnishings of, a, of yeah, what a normal life would look like. And, and then they, they use that to sort of show what the tomorrow's normal could look like. Um, another example is this by Ver Revito Cohen. It's called assistance animals, uh, or this, spe this specific one is a respiratory dog, and it's uh, drawing on inspiration from like assistant animals, like a uh, guide dog or service cats. Um, I mean, uh, uh, when you have a guide dog, you like you have a sort of like natural symbiosis with the with the animal because you're sort of like you're very much relying on them and. They're relying on you to get food, at least. Um, and and Veritol is asking, could animals be transformed <laughs> into medical devices? Um, this one is sort of giving um, new life to um, uh, running dogs, greyhounds, I guess they're called. Uh, uh, because greyhounds are bred to, um, to for the racing industry. Um, and they'll spend, I think, about the first 12 months of their year, like, training to chase uh, lure. And then the next three to five years, they'll be uh, racing. And then, uh, like, making profit for their owners. And then at around five, they would normally be euthanized because, like, you don't need them anymore. So instead of euthanizing them, you give them a new life as a um, respiratory assistance dog. Um, they go through a complementary training and then as they're completed they, they will be adopted by a patient that is dependent on mechanical ventilation. Uh, so the greyhound is fitted with a harness and then uh, the harness sort of like converts the dog's lung movements into mechanical ventilation and the treadmill functions as an on-off switch for like emergency when you need like increased amount of air because then when it's running it will like um, here's another example of like, this is more, let's say, bioengineering future. Um, I is, she's proposing that, okay, what if we in the future could uh, give birth to other species? And um, she chose this uh, sh shark called Squalus ancatias. And it's both qualified as vulnerable, so like could be endangered, but it's also consumed. And she's asking like, okay, what happens? Well, like maybe like if instead of giving birth to a child, if you don't want to have a child, you could you could still experience the being pregnant and give birth to a <laughs> to a shark uh, and like help these endangered species. Uh, but also. What if, since since this is a shark that we are we uh, or some people eat, they consume? How does that dynamic uh, when you're when you give birth to it? Do, do you still want to consume it? <laughs> uh, 
The following message was created by the Special Programs Programme, a unit launched to envision possible futures for the European Union. Life begins at 100, and the Your Life Programme is here to support you navigate through the challenges that life brings you. The programme provides beneficiaries with access to a wide selection of tools. Thanks to the Your Life Programme, I was able to attain a new balance in life. The consultants <coughs> answered all my questions on insurance and really helped me and my family to embrace life. Alors, avant d'entrer dans ce programme, je ne pouvais à peine marcher. Et depuis que j'ai connu Your Life Program, wow, magnifique, on a changé toutes mes articulations. Et j'ai retrouvé grâce à tout ça, cette jeunesse que j'avais perdue. Je me sens tellement libre maintenant de pouvoir marcher, courir, sortir. Je me sens vraiment heureuse. The special programs program. So that was a, a future where they were predicting that we would live to like maybe 300 years and then like maybe at around 80 you start having problems with like insurance or relationships maybe you need some advice on like when you've had friends for 100 years like how do you go on and this kind of thing so the examples that I showed you, I mean, they're not predictions of the future. They're just trying to propose different, like, possible alternatives, like this could happen or this could happen, so that we can navigate towards where we want to go. Um, I showed you sort of like videos or actual physical products. This is a different way of doing speculative design. Per, they, they um, Joseph Lindley, they wrote, he together with his professor, he's a um, PhD student, they wrote an actual speculative article about um, this concept uh, called a game, a game of Drones, which is um, a gamified uh, service for local authorities to uh, that aid the enforcement uh, of locals by law. So like, basically, if you have, if you're a private person and you have a drone, uh, you can like help the local authorities to sort of catch people that are um, um, parking in the wrong place or like you know these kind of things. There's a little video, so I'll read the I'll read the um, abstract because it's so it's very like uh, written in like a normal article way. In response to the recent European uh, directive, the UK government sanctions the use of drones by commercial providers subject to the pilots holding an approved drone pilot. Okay, 
so I c can't pause and read at the same time. I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, anyway, the idea of the of the article is that they 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 propose this idea that okay, um, normal people, especially in the article, they say especially like old policemen really enjoy this um, game of like driving around with their drone and, and checking if somebody has parked wrong or something. <laughs> <laughs> and what they do with the article is that they also design the artifact that goes with the story. Like they don't only not only write the article, but for instance, they design the, the um, regulation policy or the, um, the signs that would go with this concept or there's a map of the drone enforcement area. So they're sort of like exploring the practical issues of an introduction of a specific technology. Not only the technology itself, but all the supporting structures that needs to happen for this technology to exist. Um, but then there, there's sort of this question like, there's a lot of like people, designers that call themselves speculative or critical designers and they say, okay, Critical design aims to expose hidden assumptions, provoke action, spark debate, and perhaps change values and behaviors. They have like really grand ideas of what this sh should do, but most of speculative design project looks like this. They're, they're exhibited in like white cubes. And it's also very um, sort of, should I say, white privilege academic cube, this speculative design. So like, where is the debate that they want to generate, where is it actually happening? Is it even happening? Uh, and also, like going to this kind of exhibition and seeing strange objects, a normal person wouldn't necessarily like understand what it's even for, or like, what are you trying to tell me? Like, you don't necessarily get what they are proposing that you should get. Um, but there are ways of using design fiction or speculative design that might be more useful. Uh, one that has been done at Alto, where I study, um, there has been, I'm not sure if it's still ongoing, but there has been a huge uh, research program called Design for Value that is focusing on uh, new types of business models aiming to create uh, business growth through digital disruption. And it's like a huge research um, project with 11 Finnish companies uh, like Maritime Logistics and Manufacturing and nine research partners. And the project is exploring door-to-door -door supply chains, autonomous systems, new technologies in order to create value together, new models, partnerships, this kind of like innovation, very like businessy. Um, and what some researchers from also um, did was that they designed a co-design workshop uh, where the aim was to get some of the project uh, participants to open up uh, the discussion about the ecosystem in terms of like acceptance, um, like how would they adopt this new ecosystem of um, automized um, um, technologies and systems. Uh, and and sort of discuss more of the societal aspects of it. Um, and what they did was that they used design <coughs> fictions <coughs> to put the worker in the center because uh, when you're talking about autonomous systems, that means basically that you're losing workers, right? You're going to get rid of workers because it's cheaper. Like you just use the autonomous system instead. So what they did was that they put the worker in the center of this potential future where the autonomous system existed. And um, they had different cards where they were proposing different stories um, in order to make these business people talk about uh, workers and the societal impacts of it. So they were actually getting, what I'm getting at here is that they're actually getting the people that are designing these new systems to talk about the future and the societal impacts of it. So they're sort of, um, yeah, getting the big man to talk about these issues. Um, another workshop, uh, or another one that is quite interesting, is this one, uh, where they are um, designed by Studio We, 
um, where they are trying to use um, speculative design in terms of uh, policy design. So they are looking at, uh, and in this particular workshop, they were looking at a little bit similar to the past one, like uh, automation, skill development, and then like workplaces in the future. Um, so they had the partic participants um, develop a future scenario in 2048. Um, and I'm going to read like one of the scenarios that the participants came up with. Post-work taxation. High-skilled jobs have been automated, affecting the taxation and economic system of most countries. For this reason, automation is still starting, uh, is starting being taxed to extract basic incomes for citizens. Governments are committed to find new ways for people to contribute to the development and well-being of society as work is no longer the driving activity. For this reason, the government decide or is forced to replace the capitalist system. There is no exchange of money for goods or services and supports a society where self-actualization is as important or more than productivity. And then there's like a um, scenario or a, a little story about um, uh, the protagonist, which is called Flower. Flower, 50, is a doctor that lives in 200 and uh, 2048 in a period where automation tech went through life-changing breakthrough and medicine finally found a way to diagnose Cardiolopus X, a disease that developed for the too intense use of social networks. Flower no longer needs to work due to the contribution of that robots are giving to the workforce, but she is still due to fulfill her productivity quota. Although she is not obliged to work at the hospital anymore, she is still concerned about her patients. So there is an emotional labor component to her choice now of social activities as she wonders what is next for her in so many options. Um, so the product that they designed was the productivity quota in this future. And it's a home device that tracks the amount of contribution you provide to the society through your daily activities. Uh, to maintain your universal basic income benefits. It comes with a guide to after-work lifestyle. The device needs to be checked multiple times per day to reinvent yourself regularly, focusing on present while high-skilled jobs are replaced by robots and money is obsolete. Um, and then they sort of go through like, okay, if that is the scenario, what are the different um, things that happens in order for that scenario to happen? <coughs> and they use also this to um, come with uh, recommendations for today. So, okay, if that's a scenario and these are the things that are going to happen in order for that scenario to like, come true, then these, this is what we propose that you should do now. For instance, uh, design principle one, reassure population basic basics needs are met, like when you don't have any money and everybody needs universal basic income, then you have to make sure that everybody has their basic needs met. So then they say, well, everybody defined their basic needs differently, so you need to have a consultation, like the, the recommendation is then to have like a public consultation of what everybody mean when they say basic, right? So that's a way of using speculative design sort of like to say, okay, we're going here and then you sort of trace backwards of like what you should do today. Now how I see um, speculative design and LARP are sort of there to get like, okay, you have this fictional world and also in terms of speculative design, people are like trying to, okay, they, maybe they are producing a product, but really they want to produce the story around the product. They want to produce the, the social norms that are happening in that world. Well, then I say like, okay, why don't you just embody it, why don't you actually live it out, not only have it in an exhibition on the table. And I have a quote from Eleanor, <laughs> um, because I think that, as she says, like, yeah, especially when you're designing systems, you'll have these maps of like, oh, yeah, this goes here and this goes here, and it's very, like, technical, but you're not actually experiencing that. You're so unable to uh, figure out what is actually sort of the social implications of something that you're trying to design, you're going to have to embody it. Um, the food 
uh, print project that I showed you. This is part of a master thesis that Will Brown did. So he, he sort of looked at, okay, here's the proposal for the future. And then he also looked at how you could get there or like how you could work towards it from now. And he had this, um, uh, he invited to this speculative lunch um, called Fair Share Lunch, where you get, um, you make people do food choices based on the future where environmental impact is the currency, like he proposed. So everybody gets this, this um, speculative curren currency that is like one tenth of a fair share, and I think everybody gets ten. So the menu is like there's a starter, main course, and dessert, and uh, the items they cost different fair <laughs> share based on you know the environmental impact. And then you have to make choices when you're eating the lunch. You have to make choices on what you want to eat based on environmental impact through this. So he's like this is sort of like it's like a very, very small semi-LARP, <laughs> in a way. Um, another example is this um, Abacus wedding data graphy, uh, which is a concept sort of inspired by wedding photography, but instead of um, having photography, you have, um, uh, you have a professional capture and curate meaningful and ev evocative data from your wedding. Um, <laughs> so they had um, they designed um, this like fictional service and sort of larped out the consultation event. So they had one that was playing the professional wedding data grapher, consult an en engaged couple of like what kind of data they wanted to capture and how did they want to present it at the end of the wedding. So one of the things they designed was um, these cards where for instance like oh maximum heart rate. <laughs> um, how I see um, why we should sort of bridge uh, LARP and speculative design is that it, it makes for a participatory tool because LARPs are, well, they're collaborative. It's a collaborative story. Whereas when you have a speculative design that is, for instance, the object in a museum, in an exhibition, it's one story told by one designer, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to tell this story about the future. Whereas in a LARP, you, you'll, you'll everybody contributes to the potential uh, story of the future. Um, another part is that, well, fictional experiences are also real. Like, it is maybe more impactful. So, for instance, let's say that a programmer um, joins in a LARP where he experiences online sexual harassment, he might be more inclined to like thinking about how he designs um, uh, or programs digital uh, services because he has actually experienced it in a LARP. So it might be more powerful in, in when you're designing things, maybe. Um, the third part is well, I wanted to put a nice quote here, but I don't know if it actually relates. Uh, at any moment in any social system, there are multiple competing and even incompatible interests. Thus, visions of what is the preferred situation. I mean, what I mean here is that if you have a speculative design and it's just an object on a table, you're not going to... Uh, it might tell you a little bit about some of the social norms. Uh, that that would exist in that future. But it's not going to tell you much about power relations, for instance. Uh, and it's not going to tell you about, well, for instance, the wedding, uh, wedding data grapher um, LARP, it's very small, it's very contained. It's only the consultation. But, but what about the guests of the wedding? And what about the whole industry of the wedding data grapher industry? So sort of with a LARP, you can, you can bring in like more aspects of the society and how they connect to each other, um, including power relations, oppressions, and this kind of things. So um, that's it for me. <laughs> uh, 
and I can say that I'm trying or like I'm in the process of writing my master thesis which sort of have the title of um, uh, how can LARP be used as a design research tool for uh, researching uh, or investigating social political implications of design. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>